And I'm Sarah Shannon, Executive Director of Hesperian Health Guides. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Hesperian, we create and distribute practical information in 85 languages that inspires people to take action to improve their health and to organize to improve the health of their community. And I encourage you to check out our publications, online content, and apps. And I want to welcome you to Making the Connection, Fracking Plastic and People's Health. We've organized this webinar together with the People's Health Movement Extractive Industry Circle, of which we are a member. And we're excited to host this evening's discussion about the connections between fracking, plastic production and disposal, and how raising awareness about the harmful health impacts of these processes can strengthen local and global struggles for environmental health and justice. I'm delighted to bring together and into conversation with each other this evening, two organizations um, whose work I deeply respect and with whom Hesperian has collaborated on these issues. Let me welcome Dr. Ned Kitayer, Medical Advisor of the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project, or the EHP. The EHP is a nonprofit public health organization providing general organ information and specific health advice to people affected by fracking and supporting individuals and communities in preventing and documenting health harms related to fracking. With the collaboration of the EHP and others, Hesperian is developing a short resource to explain the health and environmental harms of fracking, looking at every step of the process from drilling to plastics production. Ned will be speaking first, followed by Denise Patel, who is the US Program Director of the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, Gaia. Gaia is a global alliance of over 800 grassroots organizations and individuals working towards just alternatives to waste and pollution to replace the practice of incineration. And I want to appreciate that Gaia was a key partner in developing Hesperian's Community Guide to Environmental Health and in helping test the materials related to solid waste and medical waste. Following presentations by Ned and Denise, Dr. Baj Mukabaji of the People's Health Movement Canada and a founding member of the Extractive Industry Circle will moderate discussion during the last 20 minutes of the webinar. You're invited to post questions in the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen if you're on, well, on your Zoom screen throughout. And my colleagues, Lori Berenson and Johanna Kobijo will be helping Baj to monitor the Q&A. And with that, let's get started, Ned. Thank you, greetings from Pennsylvania. Uh, I cannot share my screen. I'll need you to, there you go. Very good. Okay, can you see my screen? Very good. Well, um, Sarah, thank you for the invitation to come uh, and speak tonight. Uh, it truly is my pleasure to be here. Uh, I live and work in Washington County, Pennsylvania, uh, which is the most heavily fracked county in Pennsylvania in the Marcellus Shale gas patch. My work with environmental uh, health project and Physicians for Social Responsibility Pennsylvania focuses mostly on the evidence of health harms due to fracking. Uh, which has been underway here in Pennsylvania uh, for more than a decade. In addition to methane, the region has abundant reserves of ethane, uh, which is a liquid hydrocarbon used to manufacture plastic and other petrochemicals. It is ethane that is the prize of the Marcellus Shale. The purpose of rapidly expanding fracking operations here is to establish a brand new petrochemical and plastics hub in the upper Ohio River Valley, far away from the US Gulf Coast and what's known as Cancer Alley. And that's where the petrochemical and plastic in uh, industry is uh, currently situated. We now have abundant scientific and medical evidence that fracking seriously damages the health of people the environment, and the planet's climate system. So this is what fracking looks like in Pennsylvania, which is the second largest natural gas producing state in the nation. There are now more than 12,700 active shale gas wells in the state, which you can see as the purple dots 
on this frack tracker map. Most of the activity is in the northeastern and the southwestern parts of the state. Uh, and almost all of it has happened in uh, about 12 to 15 years. And now on the left, you can see Allegheny County. That's the west of the state. Uh, and you can see Pittsburgh is there. And you can see there's very little activity around the city of Pittsburgh. And that's because Pittsburgh has banned fracking. Uh, the green dots on this map show um, where several hundred compressor stations are located and they uh, help move the gas through the pipelines. The yellow dots indicate all of the violations and you can see that there are more violations than active wells in Pennsylvania. More than 1.5 million Pennsylvanians live within a half mile of an unconventional gas well. 300,000 children attend school within a half a mile. Fracking not only threatens their health and safety, but it threatens everyone's health and well being. Let's zoom out um, of the Pennsylvania gas patch and look at what's going on in the rest of the Ohio River Valley on both sides of the river in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. The orange dots on this frack tracker map indicate all the fracked gas wells that are mostly there to extract ethane to make plastic. From those wellheads, fracked ethane will make its way via pipeline to this ethane cracker plant currently being built by Royal Dutch Shell in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Now this is one of the largest petrochemical and plastic factories ever built anywhere. The Shell Ethane Cracker Plant is located less than 24 miles from the point in downtown Pittsburgh. The city's long history of air pollution reminds us that air toxics will travel with prevailing west to east winds along the river valley toward downtown. Here's another view of the ethane cracker plant uh, being constructed. This was taken last summer, uh, where ethane molecules will be thermally and chemically broken or cracked into ethylene. Once this cracker plant is completed and operational in the next year or so, it will produce 1.8 trillion tons of these tiny plastic polyethylene pellets which are known as nurdles. Nearly 2 trillion nurdles will be produced every year from just one cracker plant. They will be put in boxes and sent to plastic factories in Pennsylvania and other states and other countries too. Uh, at least two or three other cracker plants are expected to be, expected to be built along the Ohio River uh, over the next decade or so. This will require more than 1,000 new fracked gas wells drilled every year in order to provide the ethane necessary to make more plastic, uh, most of it for single use. Plastic that ends up scattered on our land, in our soil, in our streams and rivers and oceans, uh, is a persistent environmental health threat to everyone. The life of plastic begins at the wellhead where fracking for ethane is just the first of many threats to human health during its life cycle. The creation of plastic nurdles and the production of consumer products, most of which are designed for single use, compound the dangers until we decide one day that we're done with it and we dump the plastic and its toxic components into landfills and streams and oceans, into our air, our water and our soil and our food and eventually into you and me. Science is quickly learning that toxic emissions and chemicals 
associated with plastics is harmful to our health during our life cycle. Many are highly irritating to the skin, our gastrointestinal tract, and our lungs. Many affect the outcome of pregnancies and interfere with fetal and infant growth and brain development. We now understand how some toxics act as endocrine disrupting chemicals, affecting human development and reproduction. Some weaken the immune system, some increase the risk of chronic inflammatory diseases, and some damage organs directly, especially the brain, the liver, and the kidneys. And dozens of chemicals appearing in the life of plastics are linked to cancers in children and adults, including 55 individual chemicals used in fracking. Plastics are strong, they're durable, they're cheap, but these same properties that make plastics so useful to our society, strength, durability, affordability, make plastics so dangerous when we throw them away. Once in the environment, plastic slowly breaks down and erodes into smaller units, eventually becoming tiny, tiny particles called microplastics that can be carried by winds and currents near, to near and distant places. As this happens, chemicals added to plastic separate and enter the environment, contaminating the air and the water and the soil and the food that we and our children depend on. So here is what we know about horizontal drilling and um, hydraulic fracturing, uh, otherwise known as fracking. We know it is inherently dirty and dangerous and industry rules and government regulations can't fix it. It pollutes the air, the water and the soil that we all share. It scars the landscape and degrades the environment that humans and all life forms depend on. It accelerates climate change and threatens the future of our children and it makes people sick. The pollution from fracking happens at every point of infrastructure, not just at the well wellhead. Uh, it comes from all the diesel trucks uh, and the big diesel engines that are uh, necessary to generate enormous pressure that helps fracture the shale, which is a mile or so under our feet. Diesel fumes uh, are highly, uh, highly toxic uh, to humans. Uh, very dangerous to our health. Uh, then there's the toxic and radioactive waste that flows back from deep under the ground and has to be disposed of in landfills and injection wells where even more pollution occurs. Radioactive and toxic fracking waste is a huge problem that has never been solved. Pipelines gouge the land. They occasionally leak and spill and they can corrode and explode. Compressor stations move gas through the pipelines and they emit copious volumes of air pollution, fine particulate matter, ozone forming nitrogen oxides, cancer causing VOCs and radon gas and greenhouse gases that accelerate the climate crisis. Pollution continues at gas processing facilities that separate and refine the hydrocarbons and then beyond at LNG terminals and petrochemical factories and cracker plants to make more plastic. The aggregate pollution from all of these points of infrastructure accumulates in the environment and in us, making people very sick. In December, Concerned Health Professionals of New York and Physicians for Social Responsibility released the seventh edition of the Fracking Science Compendium, which is a fully referenced up to the minute compilation of the evidence outlining the risks and harms of fracking collected from more than 2000 peer reviewed medical and scientific papers, investigations by journalists and government reports. This essential report is a collection of the evidence-based science 
which tells us that fracking has grave health, environmental justice, and climate impacts. Like all the editions before it, the seventh edition finds no evidence that fracking can operate without threatening public health directly or without imperiling climate stability upon which public health depends. People who live near fracked gas operations report many different adverse health symptoms. My colleague said Environmental Health Project published a study in 2017 looking at the health symptoms of adults living within one kilometer of a well pad in Pennsylvania. Sleep disruption is often the result of nonstop, tru nonstop truck activity, noise, odors, and light while a well is being drilled and fracked. Headaches and throat irritation are also widely reported. Stress and anxiety are side effects of living near fracking sites. Some of these symptoms look like nuisance complaints, but when people are exposed to fracking activities and pollution day in and day out for weeks and months and years at a time, these acute symptoms of exposure and stress often become chronic medical problems. There are numerous examples of drilling and fracking activities contaminating rivers, streams, and aquifers in Pennsylvania and other oil and gas patches uh, around the country and around the world, in fact, making the water unsafe to drink. Last year in Pennsylvania, a two-year grand jury investigating um, uh, pollution in groundwater and surface water charged two fracking companies of illegally polluting these water sources. More than 200 different air pollutants have been identified near drilling and fracking operations. 61 are classified as hazardous air pollutants with known health risks, and 26 are classified as endocrine disruptors. Several others increase cancer risk. Now I'm gonna show you this list of the common airborne emissions from uh, petrofrac operations, uh, but I'm gonna skip over the details. Uh, you can see particulate matter, volatile organic compounds, the fumes of fossil fuels, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. The fracking chemicals themselves can become aerosolized and airborne. Um, silica dust, heavy metals, carbon monoxide, which is toxic to every human. Uh, nitrogen dioxide, which forms ozone. Uh, there's radioactivity in uh, shale formations, especially in the Marcellus shale formation. And a whole lot of greenhouse gases are emitted as well. Uh, these toxic emissions, uh, uh, most of them are invisible. You can't see them with the naked eye. Uh, and they're serious threats to everyone's health, especially for people who live and work near fracking sites. Multiple studies from Pennsylvania and other states tell us that living near fracking sites raises the risk for pregnant women and their babies. It can complicate pregnancies and lead to poor birth outcomes like prematurity, low birth weight, small for gestational age newborns and birth defects, all of which have lifelong consequences for children and their parents. Fracking brings foul odors, light pollution and noise pollution which can lead to loss of sleep, cognitive impairment, and stress. In fact, stress is a side effect of fracking and exacerbates mental health conditions in gas patch communities. Crime, drug and alcohol abuse, sex trafficking, sexually transmitted infections, and traffic fatalities happen at higher rates wherever fracking operates. Fracking jobs are some of the most dangerous jobs in America. 
industry workers who are exposed to physical injury, air pollution, chemicals, and radiation may not have the personal protective equipment necessary to protect themselves and their families from harm. Living near fracking sites makes people sick. It has been linked to mental health concerns like anxiety and depression and other health problems like asthma and rashes, headaches, and unfortunately, cancer. From 2008 to 2018, in four heavily fracked counties in southwestern Pennsylvania, two reporters from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette uncovered 27 cases of Ewing sarcoma, which is a very rare and frequently fatal bone cancer in children, and 40 cases of other rare cancers for a total of 67 rare cancers in children, teenagers, and young adults. In Washington County, where I live and work, six cases of Ewing sarcoma and 30 other rare childhood cancers were counted. These numbers are far more than would be expected to occur in a similarly populated, mostly rural area over a 10 year period. And new cases keep popping up. Parents and physicians are very concerned that pollution and toxic waste from fracking operations may be to blame for this rare childhood cancer outbreak. Finally, I do want to end by talking about the impact of fracking on climate change. Methane leaks like crazy from every site of frack gas infrastructure, from the well pad to the stovetop and all places in between. As you know, methane is 86 times more potent a greenhouse gas compared with carbon dioxide over a 20 year time frame. The industry likes to say that fracking helps solve climate change, but that's a myth, it's not true. In fact, fracking accelerates climate change and threatens the health of every child on the planet today, as well as generations to come. Fracking is simply incompatible with solving the climate crisis. It's not a bridge fuel on the road to, renew to a renewable energy future, as some would like you to think. Uh, instead, fracked gas is a bridge on the highway to climate catastrophe. So we are left with a choice, uh, and the choice is simple, planet or plastic. We can't have it both ways anymore, and looking back, we probably never could. Uh, as a pediatrician and a father, I know that children live in a world shaped by our choices. It's now up to us to abandon fracking and all fossil fuels and the petrochemicals and plastics derived from them and transition to a safer, a healthier and a cleaner future for our children, our grandchildren and generations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me um, to join this webinar. I'm really glad to be able to talk to you all um, about plastic waste today. Um, I think it's, I think you're going to hear a lot of commonalities between what I talk about and what Ned had to say. Um, so I really just want to thank um, Lori and Sarah. Now I got an introduction already. Um, about our organization. So I'm going to skip a couple of slides and jump right in. Um, but this is a picture of some of our members from Asia and um, from Africa. They had a Zero Waste Academy meeting um, and all got together to plan 
how we can shift away, not just from plastic, but all kinds of waste towards a zero waste system. Um, that is one of our um, areas of focus. We're not just looking at the problems of incineration, um, but also looking to the solutions. Um, plastics in the US um, is, an, is an interesting case study. Um, Gaia is one of the conveners of the Break Free from Plastic movement. Um, we have hundreds of organizations across the entire world now who are banded together um, to fight back against plastic waste. And in the US, we have partnerships with organizations that are also working to fight on the petrochemical side, on the extraction side. Um, in 1960, plastic waste in the US was zero. Um, by 2015, plastics made up over 13.1% of the total waste stream, and globally, 15.5% of plastic is incinerated. The end, the end result here is that only 9% of all plastics are actually ever recycled. Since, since they first started being produced in the 1950s, only 9% has ever actually been recycled. The rest um, is exported, and this is an important thing to keep in mind because in the U.S., if it hits your recycle bin and gets collected, it's counted as recycled, even if ultimately that's not what happens. So if you're thinking about the 9%, it's the stuff that hits your recycle bin and gets collected and goes somewhere. Um, it used to be that China had set up a, an entire market around plastic recycling. Um, they were one of the main countries that was accepting plastic waste from the US and from around the world. Um, they actually imported 50, 51%, as you can see. Um, but by the end of 2018, they, the, that import level shrank to 99.1%. In just one year, the one country that had set up literally an entire industry around plastic waste recycling decided that it was no longer going to accept plastic waste imports from the US and other countries. Um, and the reason they did that was because the same things that we hear about um, where, when you talk about incinerators and landfills in the US um, where there's lots of pollution, um, the same thing was happening in these plastic trade sites across Southeast Asia. So not just in China, um, but also in Southeast, all across Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and a number of countries. Um, plastic waste was piling up um, in villages and in communities and in, and in entire sections of, of some of the big cities and where it existed, it was contaminating water supplies, um, was leading to crop death in the, in the farmland areas where the villages were. Um, there was respiratory illness associated from the exposure to burning plastic because a lot of the plastic was actually shredded up, washed, cleaned, whatever, but then there was also a significant portion of it that was just being burned, particularly the type of plastic that was too contaminated or not the right type of plastic to actually be able to be sold on the recycling market. Um, and there was an increase in the rise of organized crime around this entire uh, system that was set up of marketing the plastic waste um, and processing it and selling it. Um, so those countries were really shouldering the economic, social, and environmental costs of all of our pollution possibly could have been, could have been the case for generations to come if they had it started to reject acceptance of this plastic waste. Um, we worked with a number of organizations um, as Gaia in Southeast Asia and started to collect stories of the impacts that plastic and plastic waste was having on these communities. Um, and you can see some of the quotes um, from the environment minister of Malaysia said, I hate seeing my country as the dump site for the developed world. Um, and that's why after China banned plastics, so did Thailand, or plastic waste, so did Thailand, India, Taiwan, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Um, they continue to increase their bans and restrictions on these types of materials. Um, and what we saw as a result of that, because Gaia works with communities across the world, was that the plastic waste flows then started, started to shift to other countries, including Indonesia and Turkey. Um, in the U.S., we're seeing more of the plastic actually going to Mexico as well. Um, meanwhile, there's pressure building in the U.S. because as municipalities were collecting all of this plastic waste, they used to sell it all um, through the markets and it would end up in Asia. 
but all of the cities and towns, like your neighborhood collection, um, all of that stuff, all that plastic had nowhere to go anymore. It used to be that your town, your city, your county could sell the plastic bales. Um, and that was actually income for having, that usually paid for the collection system and maybe a little bit extra. Um, but the market really did crash. Once, once China stopped accepting the waste and all these other countries started um, stopped accepting the waste as well, um, there was a proliferation of, you know, trade in plastic waste all over the place, but it didn't provide a clear market um, for U.S. country, U.S. municipalities um, and others to actually be able to sell the waste anywhere. And then what we started to see was that increasingly the plastic waste was getting dumped in landfills, um, it was getting incinerated. Um, at one point, uh, some of the plastic that was being put into shipping containers to be shipped um, out of the country were just sitting on the reports. Um, poor communities were being subjected to worse pollution from those incinerators. Uh, there was a case with the Chester incinerator uh, in Philadelphia that are outside, just outside Philadelphia, where when uh, the market crashed, Philadelphia started collecting all their plastic and sending it straight to the incinerator. Um, and a number of Gaia members and other organizations banded together and were able to stop that from from continuing. Um, and so they're no longer incinerated at the Chester in the Chester facility, but that plastic waste is still going somewhere. Um, some of the towns um, and cities across the U.S. have actually cut down their recycling program, uh, particularly the collection of number three to seven plastics. There is really no real market for recycling those materials. Um, as Gaia, um, as I mentioned, we actually focus a lot of our work on fighting and shutting down incinerators. Um, and I wanted to note that 58 out of the 73 municipal solid waste incinerators are located in environmental justice communities. This is just one type of burn facility that accepts plastic waste, usually just as part of like the regular trash collection. Um, and sometimes some of the recycling collection, um, as we saw at the case in Philadelphia. Um, in addition to that, there are cement kilns all over the country that also accept plastic waste. And we're increasingly seeing plastic um, pellets, like the nurdles that Ned was talking about, once those are processed, being sent to cement kilns, as well as industrial facilities that used to really rely on coal um, to actually burn and produce enough energy electricity to run their processes. So we're increasingly seeing plastic replacing coal as that energy source. Again, like the people are, are the focus are the people are the ones that we really focus on around incinerators. And so um, along with those 58, 58 incinerators, um, some of the other things to note are that 4.4 million people actually live within three miles radius of a municipal solid waste incinerator. So out of all the 73, you add up everybody who lives around a three mile radius and could be subjected to air emissions um, out of the old stacks, um, that's 4.4 million people. Approximately 1.6 million people live within um, the, the 12 dirtiest facilities. And those are top emitters of PM 2.5, NOx, lead and mercury, and Ned touched on some of the health effects of that. Um, 10 out of 12 incinerators that emit the greatest amount of lead emissions are in EJA communities. And the top three are in Baltimore, Camden, and Newark. And these are significantly impacted communities um, that have a lot of other industry around them as well. And so the cumulative impact burden on the people who live um, around incinerators is quite large. Um, I wanna talk a little bit just about some of the health impacts from incineration itself. Um, and I thank Ned for talking about, you know, some of the community health impacts of fracking um, in South Baltimore, uh, where the infamously polluting Wheelabrator trash incinerator is located, um, there are noxious odors um, that are a regular part of everyone's lives who live around that incinerator in South Baltimore. Um, they regularly report headaches, respiratory illnesses, and shorter lifespans. Um, well, the Baltimore community is one that we work really closely with. Um, and one of our community partners um, often talks about how so many kids in that community have asthma, not just from the incinerator, but all of the cumulative burdens of, from, that 
that contribute to the air pollution that the local high school doesn't even have like a basketball team because there aren't enough kids who could actually um, play without you know suffering from asthma attacks. And that, that was a pretty startling thing to learn about their local high school. And it was actually the high school students themselves who led a campaign um, to prevent a new incinerator from being, being built in Baltimore. And a lot of those uh, teenagers who were able to stop the energy transfers project um, a few years ago are now working to shut down the wheel abrader facility as well. Um, it's a great community story and um, it's always an inspiration to work with them. Um, interestingly enough, the, the folks in Baltimore also partnered with um, John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins researchers, and they did a study and they figured out that not only is that incinerator the largest source of industrial air pollution in South Baltimore, um, but it's also, also that its emissions cause an estimated $55 million in healthcare expenses annually. So you can see how in a, in a neighborhood or in a community that's already um, stricken with poverty because of the economic extraction and the pollution that they face on top of that, they have increasing healthcare expenses because of all of that pollution as well. Um, I mentioned the story about Philadelphia um, and I got ahead of myself a little bit, but I wanted to point out that one of the, the Chester residents and community activists um, who really fought to prevent um, the plastic waste from ending up in the Chester incinerator is Zuline Mayfield. Um, and she was quoted in one of the local papers as saying that, that people in Chester really feel hopeless. All they want is for their kids to get out and escape. Why should we be expendable? Why should this place have to be burdened by people's trash and shit? And I think that is a sentiment that is felt by many of the EJ communities that we work with across the country. Um, and truly describes the, the inequality and equity of, of the waste that we all are responsible for producing that ends up in these EJ communities. Meanwhile, um, the industry, the petrochemical industry, largely led um, by the American Chemistry Council at this point, are pushing false solutions. So as they continue to produce more and more plastic because um, fracked Fracked um, gas produces really cheap single-use plastic. It makes recycling unviable as an alternative. The, the industry doesn't really want recycling to succeed, and they don't really want to stop extracting um, all of that methane to produce more plastic because that's where they're making all of their money. Recycling is expensive for them to do. Um, funding all of those collection systems costs municipalities, and then they just end up getting dumped somewhere, and the industry is able to continue to profit off of not only extraction point, but the end point as well. What they've recently started to do is to push for these technologies that they call chemical recycling or advanced recycling. And what it is, is it's a technolo technological process that involves pyrolysis um, or gasification. So they take all the plastic waste, they clean it up, they shred it, and they put it through um, a myriad of chemicals, and then at the end you get um, a number of products. It could be um, things like naphtha, which can be turned into new plastics, um, and some polymers and monomers that can be turned into new plastics. But from what we're seeing, most of what happens is that it's turned into either a waste product, which then has to be dealt with at a hazardous waste incinerator or facility, or um, the thing that I think the thing that a lot of the industry is pushing for, especially um, in partnerships with um, fossil fuel companies, is to turn the plastic into a fuel, uh, which they're starting to market um, to, that could be used in um, in air in airplanes um, for jet fuel, um, but has up until now primarily, I think, been marketed to be used uh, as shipping fuel. Um, it's incredibly like dirty type, it's an incredibly dirty type of fuel. And even if they were able to market it to for it to be a jet fuel or something used in our cars or trucks, um, the amount of the fuel that could be derived from plastic has to be blended with a large amount uh, of other fuels in order to prove in order for it to um, actually be usable because the, the end product of plastic to fuel is um, such a mixed chemical waste that it like 
it would probably at this point destroy your car. So the American Chemistry Council um, is doing a few things to, to achieve this end. Um, they're, they've been modeling and promoting legislation to create a market for pyrolysis and promoting it as an economic opportunity. They project that it's gonna create $10 billion in economic output, 40,000 direct and indirect US jobs, that will contribute to an additional $2.2 billion in wages. Ned talked about what the jobs are like from the fracking industry. And we've seen that a lot of the numbers that come out of the industry are inflated. And we believe that these numbers that are being taught, that are being shared by the industry um, that could come from advancing all of this new technology um, are also similarly inflated. But what we do know um, is that we, we know that pyrolysis, and I'm going to refer to um, pyrolysis and the end product being plastic fuel as I move forward through this conversation. Um, there is evidence that some plastic can be turned into other plastic through chemical processes, but the amount that it actually yields um, is not something that could ever address, truly address the, the plastic crisis that we face. Um, keeping in mind that number that I, that I talked about in the beginning, which was 91% of all plastics have never been recycled. Um, and so just to think about that, the sheer amount of plastic that's in production now. So pyrolysis, we think, is a distraction from real solutions. Uh, we believe the facilities could produce millions of pounds of toxic chemicals. Plastic to fuel is a false climate solution because burning plastics is still burning fossil fuels. Like, you're taking all of the greenhouse gas emissions that were produced from the extraction site and then as Ned was talking about, adding to the climate burden there and from escaped methane, and then it's going to a production facility where it's producing more greenhouse gas emissions. Then it's getting turned into a product at yet another facility, um, which is used in packaging or whatever, and it ends up on your store shelves and you're driving to go get it. And there's like a whole system with that. And then it, you use it for maybe like a second. If you think about a plastic water bottle, you drink the bottle and you just toss it away and you never think about it again. That's one of those examples of where it's just, it's such, people don't think about plastic because it's barely, it's something you don't really register as if you've even used it. If you use it for such a limited amount of time, it's there for seconds and then it's in the trash bin and, you, and people forget about it. And then from there it gets transported um, to a waste facility where it gets processed and then it ends up in an incinerator or a landfill or in a, or at a plastic to fuel site where it then just adds to, in addition to all the emissions up to that point, where it gets to one of these facilities, then gets processed and adds to even more emissions. So it's really not a climate solution. In addition to that, um, what we know about the technology and the process is that all of those chemicals that Ned was talking about that go into plastics, they don't just magically disappear through this chemical process. And from the few facilities that, had, that do exist, we've seen that um, there is a significant amount of hazardous waste. We're concerned that dioxins and other chemical, toxic chemicals will end up in the end product in new plastics. Um, and we're concerned that uh, as that plastic is then thrown away or tossed away and not truly recycled again, we're just gonna continue to continue be exposed to these toxic chemicals. Billions of dollars have been invested and lost in gasification and pyrolysis approaches, much like carbon capture and sequestration. The industry has been talking about pyrolysis as a as a solution for decades and li literally nothing has come of it yet. Um, and these processes, they do not work as promised. It's a waste of time and resources that should be spent developing real solutions, which is namely for us plastic reduction um, and the elimination of single use plastics. Um, so we put out a report and I'm gonna skip past this because I'm seeing that we're running low on time. Um, but I want to skip ahead and I want to, first off, before I do that, I want to direct you to this report we put out called All Talk and No Recycling. Um, it really does a deep dive into the, whether or not there actually is an industry around chemical recycling. We looked at, looked up all the facilities that were proposed and found that um, there are only three out of the 37 facilities proposed since two, the year 2000 that currently are operational. And for the mass, vast majority of them, they're probably never really going to come into fruition. But the industry is going to continue to talk about this as a solution so they can continue to extract um, natural gas and, and produce more plastics. 
Um, one thing I just do want to note is that we really don't have a clear sense of what the environmental and health impacts would be from these types of facilities. And one of the reasons we don't know that is because they don't exist. But we do know what goes into plastics, and we do know that it can't really be removed, all of those, those toxic chemicals. And so they're going to end up somewhere, and they're likely to end up around the facilities um, where the chemical recycling is happening or where all the waste is getting dumped as well. And I just wanted to touch on one of the, the types of bills that the, the American Chemistry Council is pushing. Um, as you might know, plastic waste is considered a non-hazardous waste, which means that regulation of plastic waste actually falls to individual states rather than under a federal standard. Um, that's under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. And so what we've seen over the last couple of years is that the Chemistry Council is really pushing bills to change the regulatory framework around how this plastic waste is collected and managed. And what they're really pushing to do is to reclassify post-use polymers as non-solid waste if they're used in pyrolysis and gasification. And they want to exempt those facilities from being regulated as solid waste facilities and primarily as chemical manufacturing. Uh, what they're really attempting to do here is to create that market around collecting plastic waste to end up in chemical recycling facilities and really trying to create that system in an environment where they previously have not been able to make that happen because it's not been economically viable as an industry um, to expand it. Um, Pennsylvania was actually one of the states that recently passed a bill um, it was HB 1808 in December and was signed by Governor Wolf um, in December as well. So um, I just wanted to share that. And there's a couple of bills that are actually positive in Maryland and Oregon that would exclude this technology from the definition of recycling, um, which is a very positive thing. Um, and I think in one of the states, they're, they're considering an all out ban on um, pyrolysis and gasification facilities altogether. So they couldn't even, the industry couldn't even be built in those states if they wanted to. I'm going to stop there. And I apologize for going over time. I don't know if we have some questions, but yeah. Great. And Baj is going to um, lead the discussion. Baj? Hi, everyone. Thanks very much, Denise and Ned, for your presentations. I really enjoyed uh, hearing them and learned a lot from them. I just wanted to quickly introduce who I am and where I'm from. Uh, I'm uh, Bajram Bhattai. I'm a member of the People's Health Movement in Canada. Um, and our local chapter is also uh, involved very much in the global extractive industries uh, working group of people from across the world, sort of challenging the power of extractive um, corporations uh, and, it's, and uh, trying to link communities that are resisting uh, the health impacts of extractive projects around the world. So one of our really big interests and both Ned and Denise, you made allusions to it, so I'm really hoping we can get to some of the discussion in the five minutes we have left. We'll ask maybe people to maybe stay on for another five if they're interested. Um, to, to kind of this idea of linking struggles, of how uh, struggles might be linked from one place to another, even though they seem very far apart. And we as the People's Health Movement are very interested in the health impact. So some of what you said uh, resonates very clearly. And I think already uh, there's two questions which I think um, are, are actually quite linked and maybe you'd have uh, some insight from both of you. Um, uh, do you know of cases, one question is, where communities have been successful in challenging plastic incineration projects and how do we know about, get to know about them? And then there's a very specific question from Lynn Armel in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, where they're currently fighting a plastic to fuel plant uh, from developing around the community. And um, Lynn's worried that the leaders in the media are sort of drinking the greenwashing Kool-Aid uh, and is wondering if there's any suggestions to combat that. So I think those questions are maybe a little bit linked. So um, I was wondering if either of you had any thoughts about that. I was talking for a while, so I'm happy to let Ned go first. <laughs> if you have an answer. You know, let me let me take uh, the second <laughs> question uh, from uh, uh, the uh, Erie resident, uh, not too far from where I am, uh, just south of Pittsburgh. 
Erie is north of Pittsburgh. Um, uh, you know, I think that, um, yes, the politicians are drinking the Kool-Aid, but it's important to understand that the politicians uh, don't speak the language of science. They don't think in terms of chemistry and physics and biology and health. Um, you'll, you won't hear the word health coming out of many of their mouths. Uh, you won't hear the words climate change coming out of, out of their mouths. They just don't think that way. It doesn't mean that they're stupid. They're not. They're actually very smart people. Um, many of them uh, trained in law, uh, trained in business. Uh, but what they are not trained in is understanding how to think about things in a scientific way and taking scientific evidence and uh, drawing conclusions from that. So that's really what you're faced with. I would suggest uh, that you try to find uh, as many uh, physicians, as many nurses in your community uh, that would be willing to learn a little bit about this and speak out. Uh, nurses and physicians are uh, two of the most highly trusted professional uh, uh, groups in the country. Actually, nurses are, are uh, more trusted than doctors, but both are highly trusted. And I think if you can find some physicians uh, to come to the rescue, I think that will help. Physicians for Social Responsibility might be able to help. Um, uh, we've uh, just now recently started a group called Concerned Health Professionals of Pennsylvania where we're fighting uh, fracking. So find your local helpers uh, and they should be able to help you. Neat, thanks. And I can take that first question. Um, when it comes to plastic incineration, I think in the US, um, that story of the folks from Chester, um, Pennsylvania, right out Philly, right outside of Philly, um, is probably one of the best examples um, that we've seen of a community finding out that there's a bunch of plastic waste headed towards an incinerator and being able to stop it. Um, that was really a community-led um, effort, and they were able to convince the city council pretty quickly between in just a matter of months, as soon as they figured this out, um, to stop burning plastic waste there. Um, in communities around the world, um, we, and a lot of our Gaia members have been pushing back against plastic incineration as well. A lot of the times when we were concerned about plastic waste, and I alluded to this, the plastic burning in the villages, it's really like a, co a cottage industry. Um, and they end up burning the plastic waste because there's nowhere else to send it after it ends up there. Um, and so by banning that plastic waste from even entering those countries and all of those groups that have been um, pushing um, their individual nations as well from you know, Indonesia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, it was all um, a big effort by members of Gaia and the Break Free from Plastic movement is a real testament um, to the shift that we've seen in this waste trade. Um, and I think those are some of the most successful stories that we've seen. Um, and it's really cool collaboration to be a part of because I'm gonna make a pitch for Break Free for Plastic. If you haven't checked them out, you should. There's a whole movement in the US. Um, and then in addition to Gaia, and then um, it's part of a global network. So check it out. Thanks very much. Um, there's two very specific questions I'll just put out there. Um, so uh, Barbara, from Colorado is um, talks about trying to pass a single use uh, plastic ban in the state and is interested in the other bill around it and was wondering if the bill text could be shared. And somebody was asking about um, email addresses, which I think were just put into the chat. So you can look at them uh, in the chat if uh, you're interested. Um, two other questions, we're just maybe going to take uh, two or three minutes more um, before we wrap up. Um, there's one question about um, how fracking is beginning to spread in other parts of the world, um, in low and middle income countries, with governments trying to persuade local communities that fracking is safe. And the question is, is whether um, health is a factor considered in environmental impact statements or licensing process in the US, um, and whether there's um, a information or, or a model there that could be used to see if health can be used in decision-making processes around um, such projects. 
Yeah, let, let me let me take that one uh, quickly. Um, look, it's not doctors, it's not nurses, it's not biology teachers, it's not teachers, it's not parents with young children that are telling you that all of this fracking, all of this plastic is safe. Okay, so let's just make that clear. Uh, no doctor is going to tell you that this stuff is safe uh, and that you can have it in your backyard and nothing, nothing bad is going to happen to you. Uh, what can communities do to fight it? Well, you can get informed. Uh, and one thing you can do is a health impact assessment, uh, which uh, Environmental Health Project uh, does uh, quite a bit. The things that you want to know, you want to answer four questions. What will be on the site? What equipment will be there? What, what are we talking about? What, what um, things can harm us? Uh, who will be near the site? Who's going to live there? Who's going to work there? Who's going to be going to school there? Uh, it's really important to know. Uh, what are the emissions? What, what, what happens when you burn uh, uh, methane or diesel? Well, we know that. We know chemistry. We know exactly if you burn this amount, you're going to get this amount of pollution. So know what those are. And finally, what are the health effects? Uh, you know, what happens if I breathe or, or ingest uh, this stuff? Uh, once you uh, have these questions answered, then community leaders and residents can start uh, making decisions over, you know, is this indeed something that we want to have in our neighborhood? Thanks very much, Ned. Um, and one, one maybe final question before we wrap up. There's a general question about, you know, it's important to avoid plastics in general, which is easier said than done. Um, are there any decent products made with recycled materials that we should be supporting? Um, there's a lot of great materials out there. Um, there are some materials that are actually more recyclable than others, like glass, aluminum. Um, although like glass is one of the most um, recyclable um, and safest materials. And then you have aluminum, which could be recycled a certain number of times, far more than plastic. Um, most plastics actually can't be recycled. It's really just the number ones and number twos if you're thinking like, oh, I'll just keep reusing this plastic thing. Mm, not so much. Um, and of course, paper products as well. Um, what we really recommend though is, you know, for those containers and the things that you carry out with you, like use a reusable bag, they last a lot longer. Um, use those, like carry those thermoses or a water bottle and just take those with you. Um, think about when you're shopping, um, what type of items you pick up off the shelf. If you can, you know, if you can, um, I know for a lot of folks, especially in our EJ communities, it's a real challenge to avoid plastic because not only is it on every shelf, but it's also the cheapest option. Um, so we always recommend if you're able to like avoid the thing in the plastic packaging and try to buy something, look at the alternative packaging as well and bring that up um, as a consumer um, with some of, some of the store owners too, if you're in a local shop. Um, we also know that there are some great groups out there like Greenpeace who are running campaigns to get Target and Amazon and Whole Foods um, to shift the way their shift all of their packaging away from these single use plastics and to come up with alternative systems to deliver you with, with all the things that you need in bulk or in refillable containers. Um, and so it's not just about your personal choice at a store because you probably don't really have much of one um, but really becoming engaged in all of these different types of fights and where you can, you know, cut your plastic footprint. And when you find it really challenging, uh, definitely take up, take it up with the corporations. Um, you can also lobby um, your local legislators to promote businesses that do reuse or um, other things that actually help us shift over to a zero waste system. And if you're one of those folks who wants to really get involved and build more zero waste systems in your own community or help pass policy around that, definitely check us out. We just launched a zero waste master plan, which is a guide for folks who um, want to build and expand zero waste systems in their own cities and communities. And so we're really looking for lots of folks who want to work with us in building out these solutions to join us. That's a great note to end on, Denise. Thanks very much. Um, uh, thanks very much for answering our questions. Maybe I'll hand over to Sarah to wrap up the webinar. 
Well, and really, we just want to thank everyone for joining us and a particular thanks to Ned and Denise and Baj and to our interpreters. Um, thank you again. And here's some content. Here's that contact information again for those that would like to learn more and be in touch with any of the organizations. Um, again, we look forward to being in touch with you and thank you for your solidarity around um, trying to address the health harms of fracking and plastics. Take care. Bye-bye.